Hi, good evening everyone. My name is Greta Clark and I'm a project officer at the Maritime Archaeology Trust. And this evening I'm going to be talking about D-Day landing craft repair slipways in Britain, entitled Forgotten Remnants of the Great Crusade. I thought this would be quite a nice title as of course the Great Crusade was the name given to the Normandy landings by Dwight Eisenhower in his address to the troops. And of course, this topic is very apt for this time of year because we are approaching the D-Day anniversary. So today I'm going to be talking a bit on how these slipways operated, their different categorizations, and hopefully if you're interested, how you could find some of this modern archeology span on your very own doorstep. So modern archeology span is all around us. And by modern archeology, span generally that means any artifacts from 1901 onwards. Now, some people might think, well, how on earth is Second World War archaeology? I mean, we have people alive who still remember this conflict. And a response I would have to that is just because the era was recent in relative to others. And even though we do have more written documentation, it doesn't mean an artifact from that era shouldn't be valued because there's always something new that they can tell us. And I think landing craft repair slipways are actually a prime example of this. Now, someone who did extensive work on modern archaeology, especially Second World War, was a man called C.S. Dobinson, who in 1996 wrote 20th century fortifications in England on behalf of the Council for British Archaeology. There were several volumes of this. It was quite extensive. And in them, he largely talked about Second World War defences. However, he didn't really write about landing craft slipways, so they're actually at a risk of being overlooked. So we do have, thankfully, a lot of this Second World War material that still remains in Britain. Now, as you can see from this top left picture, we have something that some of you may recognise. These are the Red Sands Forts. These are in the Thames estuary. They were built as anti-aircraft defences and then, pretty comically, uh, they became a pirate radio station in the 1960s. You also have, for example, pillboxes just like this one at the bottom here. And some of them are truly incredibly well hidden. Now, the one at the bottom right corner is actually situated in Branscombe in Devon. As you can see, it's quite overgrown. And I used to walk past this as a child. And I'm ashamed to say I had actually no idea it was there until I was in my early 20s. Now, to come a bit more local, Southampton is also a wonderful example of modern archeology. span Now, for those who have had an opportunity to check out the historic environment records, you will no doubt know this. For those who may not know, the historic environment records, or HER as some people call them, these contain information on local archaeology sites and finds. And a lot of this information is actually accessible on the Heritage Gateway website. And I've just put that at the bottom there. So some of you might be quite well versed in this already, but if not, that's a great place to start looking. So as you can see from this image, and I've drawn some of this information from the HER records and just put it on top of a map here, you can see from the light blue areas, and this is just modern archeology, span this isn't even medieval or prehistoric or anything like that. There's so much that still remains in Southampton. And again, this is just areas uh, that have been reported. So there could be more out there that just hasn't been noted yet. So you have, pillboxes, military buildings, bomb shelters, embarkation cards, and of course, uh, for anyone who is aware of the trust work, you do have the Second World War wall where soldiers carved their names, and that's quite a, quite a popular topic and subject for the trust. Now, Southampton also has a landing craft repair slipway. So I've been throwing words like landing craft around quite a lot, which anyone who's a D-Day enthusiast will know uh, quite a lot about. But for those of you who may not know, landing craft were amphibious vessels that actually allowed the Allied forces to land on the beaches in Normandy in June 1944. If you've seen any picture of soldiers disembarking on D-Day, chances are you will have seen a landing craft. And if you would like to see one in person, now you can. The Portsmouth D-Day Museum have recently renovated an LCT, which you can just see in the right picture here. An LCT is a landing craft tank. And very similarly to how the Red Sands forts were converted into a pirate radio station, pretty comically, this was also used as a nightclub. 
So land and craft were used to transport equipment, troops, automobiles, all from the southern English coast over to Normandy as part of Operation Neptune, which was the naval phase and part of the overall Operation Overlord, which was the code name for the Allied invasion of Europe and the beginning of the Allies pushing the Nazis back into Europe. So you had a variety of land craft. You had LCTs, LCMs, LCIs, and these all transported different things. And like most watercraft of some kind, they required maintenance. So this is where the slipways come in. These were built all along the coast, mostly along the southern coast, to mend land and craft before they headed over to Normandy. Now, it's key to mention here that these were different to embarkation hards. Embarkation hards were these. So these were sometimes modified docks, keys or harbours. And their purpose was, as you may have guessed by the name, for embarkation onto landing craft. So LCTs, LSTs, but not for repairing them. Now you can tell the difference between these two types of slipways because repair slipways had like a frame. They usually are concrete beams rather than a solid concrete slip. So similarly to a lot of repair slipways, a lot of the embarkation hards were purpose built between 1942 and 1944, because of course this was Britain preparing for D-Day. So the two pictures here, I'll get my marker, are of a really well-preserved embarkation hard in Torquay. Some of you may already know it. And Southampton had about three of these embarkation hards, but unfortunately I think they have all been removed now. And if anyone wants to look at these a little bit more, Stephen Fisher did a really good piece on these for Citizen, which I've just put a link for at the bottom here, if anyone would like to go and check it out. So returning to the repair slipways, these were designed by the Department of Civil Engineer in Chief, but they were built by contractors nominated by private shipping firms. So already there's quite a few people involved in their construction. And then finally, the slipways also had to be approved by the Admiralty. So just from listening to that process, you can already imagine the amount of paperwork these repair slipways would have produced. And the beauty of this is that we can now study these documents in the National Archives. So the way they worked, the slipways were used to lift the landing craft slightly ashore so that they could be repaired. And you can actually see an example from this Grove and Little diagram in the top left here. Now, the way the craft was pulled out of the water was done by two separate methods, depending on what the slipway type is. And that's actually quite key. Not all of the slipways were of the same design. It wasn't a seen one, seen them all kind of situation. And I'll actually come back to the different types in a moment. So if you live near south, the southern English coast, especially if you are near a port town or a sizable river, you'll likely have been not too far away from one of these. They're quite ubiquitous and remarkably, some of them are still really well preserved, especially as they were only supposed to be temporary. So the larger picture just to the left here was taken of a slipway in the Itchen River in the summer of 2021. It's just below the Itchen Bridge and you can actually, if I get my marker back, you can see the two columns of the bridge in the background there. So if you drive over that bridge for work every morning, you are actually driving past some pivotal Second World War archeology, span proof that it is still all around us. So a lot of these slipways haven't really been examined too well, even though they are an incredible example of ingenuity and they were built remarkably fast. So I tried to rectify that. A part of my research was identifying where a lot of these slipways were situated and the condition that some of them were still in. Now, what this involved was going through the various types of Admiralty documents at the National Archives and trying to ascertain the slipways location. Now, often the documents would give the town and site like here, and then the shipping yard would be listed just underneath. And I thought, oh, this is actually gonna be really straightforward. All I have to do is look at a map figure out the location of the shipyard, then look at modern aerial data, and then I'll find the slipway. Now, of course, it was not that straightforward. I had seemingly forgotten in that moment that development was quite vast after the Second World War. So a lot of the shipping yards registering a slipway in the early 1940s had now been either entirely built over or at least taken over by a different shipping company, meaning that, of course, it's not going to appear on a modern map. So I went back to historical maps. I looked at maps between the 1930s to the 1950s, found the areas and looked out for groups of slips that suddenly start appearing in maps in the late 1940s, or if those maps aren't accessible, certainly early 1950s. So for example, this map to our side here, these are some slipways at Saltash. 
in a map from 1953. So once I'd figured out the location of the slipways from historical maps, I then decided to plot them in GIS, which for those of you who may not know, it's a computer system and GIS stands for Geographic Information System. And the purpose of this was to see how the slipways related to each other, if there were any patterns and if there was any connections that I could glean. So these are the two maps that I created. And the figure on the left is a density map of all the slipways that were listed in the Admiralty documents in 1944. So as you can see from the legend, the more slipways in that area, the more yellow the colour. Now, perhaps what is unsurprising is that the area where a lot of the slipways were based is also where a lot of the calls were positioned pre D-Day disembarkation. So, for example, if we look at the southern west of the coast around Plymouth area, we have the US 4th Infantry Division deployed to Utah Beach. Now, in Hampshire, these were really dense in landing craft repair slipways because, of course, it was right across the channel from Normandy and had a large military basis for D-Day, which, again, those of you who follow the Trust D-Day Stories from the War project will definitely know. So now that I had established as best as possible where the slipways were originally positioned, I then decided to create a map to plot the slipways that were still visible along the southern English coast. And honestly, at this stage, I had no idea how many there was going to be. Uh, I knew there was a few, but I was a little nervous that a lot of them were going to be gone. And this did actually have mixed revol results. Now, unfortunately, as you can see from the blue dots, there are a few sites that have been removed or developed over. For example, this site here, this was known as Queen's Anne Battery. This was based in Falmouth and that had been entirely developed over. And I'm not sure how much documentation was made of the slipways before they were dismantled, if any, because certainly the documents I read, they were not referred to at all. But there is some hope, as we can see from the red dots. These do signify that some slipways are still visible. And if you actually look at the top of the map, you can see two red dots that are a lot higher than the others. And these are really interesting ones, especially this one around Whitstable because it doesn't look like it's on the coast at all. It actually looks like it's inland. So I thought I'd have a closer look and to my delight, some slipways were situated on rivers. So the river on the left is the River Torridge near Appledore in Devon. And the site on the right is in Rochester. It's on a river called the River Medway. And this basically confirmed that sites were not just built on the Southern British coast, but also in less accessible areas. And the Rochester site on the River Medway in particular ended up becoming one of my favourites because... So as you can see from this image, there's two slipways built there. But not only that, they're almost built atop of each other, which must have been an absolute nightmare to load the landing craft onto them. And this is also a great image because you can actually see a contrast between the two slipway types here. So the one on the left, this is what I would describe as a hauling end-on type. And then the one to the right here is what I would describe as a broadside grid iron, but I'll come back to types again in a minute. So after seeing that they were, there were a few remaining sites, I thought I'd have a closer look. And to my delight, some landing craft Second World War slipways are still there. And I believe from checking the aerial data that both of these in 2022 still exist. So if anyone would like to go and have a look at them, see them in person, definitely feel free to do so. So the first one is on the River Torridge in Richmond Dock in Appledore. I just mentioned it a few slides ago. And the second one is in Castletown, which is on the Isle of Portland in Dorset. Now, both of these I would class as hauling end on slipways, which is not surprising because these were the most common slipway type that was built for the war. So this brings me on to the next part of my talk, which is categorization. Now, I've mentioned a few times that not all slipways are of the same type. There is a variation. And I think why categorization is so important is because not only does it help us understand how the slipways operated, but it's also useful to give us an approximation as to when they would have been built. So currently, it's argued that there are three types of slipways. And this is stated by Fiona Small, who wrote a document on the Horsey Island slipways for Historic England. And it's a really great and helpful examination into their history. And she uses a lot of RAF photos to show their structure in the 1940s. So the slipway type small lists are 
standard hauling, or what some people call endon, broadside, and grid iron. And the pictures on this slide give the three case studies of each type. So the top left is Saltash. This is listed by Historic England as being a grid iron. The bottom left, you may recognize it, it is Castletown. It fits the end on criteria. And just to the right here, we have the horsey island slipways that Fiona Small talks about, which do fit the broadside typology. Now, whilst I do agree that this typology definition uh, is right, I do think it can be a little bit confusing. And this is because in this definition, end on, an end on slipway and a hauling slipway are synonymous. And that's actually misleading because they are in fact two different types. And the reason for this is because end on is the direction by which the craft is raised, so bow or stern, and hauling is the method by which the craft is raised. So equally, broadside is telling you the direction by which the craft is raised, so sideways, and grid iron is telling you the method by which the craft is raised. So I would say that the current categorization is all higgledy-piggledy, just to use the technical term. And I would argue that you cannot define a slipway by just one of these aspects. You have to state the side the craft is raised, so the red part, and also the method the craft is raised, so the green. And this might seem like splitting hairs, and some people might say, well, does it really matter? And I would argue yes, because it's only by thoroughly categorising them that we can understand each slipway's type characteristics, and as such, properly document them and understand their context. So whether they were specifically built for D-Day, or whether they were repurposed for the war, how would have they been operated? How quickly could they have lifted a craft? So we've covered the difference between the two sides the craft is raised, but what is the difference between the two methods the craft is raised? So hauling and gridiron. So the hauling method characteristics are having a cradle on wheels. Now this cradle would sit atop the slipway and then would be hauled up by a winch further ashore. The slipways at Horsey Island, you can actually see the winches in aerial photographs from the Second World War, and that was in the report written by Fiona Small that I just previously mentioned. Now, end-on cradles had nine sections, and these were on tracks, and these would sit atop the slipway's three beams. Now, these sections were then connected by chains so that they could roll up and down and bunch together if required. Now, after the war, Many of these cradles were left on the slipway and on odd sites, we actually dropped quite lucky and we can even see the cradles are still there, such as sites at Castletown or Appledore, which I've just shown you. Now this method, as you can see, was used for both end on and broadside. They were slightly different in design, but they used the same lifting method. They both would have required a winch. Alternatively, grid irons don't have any mechanical assistance to lift the craft. Instead, they just use the tide, so it's a lot slower, as you can imagine. Therefore, it's no wonder that the hauling method was the predominant one that was used for the war. Now, grid irons were actually built pre-20th century. There are paintings from the 19th century showing ships being lifted onto grid irons in the sideways direction. And we can see this from a large image included in a brilliant piece written by Tyler Mora just here. So on this basis, I'd like to propose an alternative categorization. And just to provide my evidence, this new categorization coincides with how the slipways were originally recorded in the Admiralty documents. So in the written documents, as you can see, there's so many references to broadside grids or end on grids. Here, they are not listed as different types. So how I've structured it, the slips are split into four types rather than three. And as I mentioned earlier, it asks both how the craft is raised and the side the craft is raised. Now, once the questions have been answered, picking one option from the two below, you put those two answers together and you get this. So now we have four categories and suddenly you've got a much clearer idea of the slipway type you're examining. And as such, based on other slipways in that exact typology, you've already got a clear idea of how it operated, when it was built and did it need a winch. And I've actually included case studies from each type in this second table. And I'm just going to focus on one, which is Itch and Cross House, as thankfully I got to do a survey of this site in the summer of 2021.
This was a survey that was conducted in August 2021 and I would just like to thank Felix Pedrotti and Stephen Fisher for helping me do this survey, uh, especially in such an uncertain time as well. And you can actually see the itch and bridge in the background a little clearer here. So this slipway fits into the type of hauling end on, meaning it was pulled up by a winch and the craft was lifted end on. And Southampton, as I previously showed in my density map, had quite a few of these slipways. They were all recorded as hauling end on type, meaning they likely would have been built especially for the war. So as many of you will recognize, the area in the map just here is just off of the Solent. And quite a few of the hauling end on slipways in Southampton were actually built on the River Itchen. And many of them, as you can see, were in close proximity. Now, a lot of the slipways in Southampton were at Thornycroft shipbuilding sites and the Itchen site, which is the Purple Cross on this map here, was built by Burbanks and Thornycroft. This site is really interesting. I mean, I would say that. But one reason I find this interesting is because if we look at the historical map from 1958, which is one here, uh, obviously over a decade after the end of the war, we see just one slipway. However, if we look at a map from 1948, of course, a few years after D-Day, we can see two slipways and we can even see just at the top here, the two winches that would have been used to haul the craft up. So I had a look at the two maps and I instantly thought, oh, that's a shame. They've deconstructed the slipway on the left. And that must have happened in the 1950s sometime because that's it's gone by 1958. So looking at the aerial photography of Itchen, we can see now that there's just concrete where the left slipway was. And if we look at the right slipway, the remaining one, we can also see that unfortunately the cradle is gone, uh, the tracks are gone. It just appears to be three beams that are still visible. And if we want to compare that to what a slipway looks like with the cradle on, we can compare it to the Castletown site where the two hauling end on slipways still have their cradles. Now you can see from the itch and slipway that in addition to the three long beams going down into the river, you also, if you look very closely just at the river's entrance, that they actually have some cross beams. And this was actually a new discovery for me. I previously thought that they were just three long beams that didn't interact. So we decided to go and do a survey of the site, see what we could figure out from the remaining slipway. And we got there and we started looking at the concrete area where the left slipway once was, which is this. And granted, it perhaps doesn't look like anything too much at the moment. But when we look closer, we noticed that there were some anomalies and you can actually see where the concrete's cracked. It's starting to show a little bit of a shape and it starts to look very similar to the right slipway just after we surveyed it. And we actually realized the left slipway is still there. The shape of the beams is what we're looking at. So this is the concrete beam going down to the river and this is a cross beam traversing it. So I looked back at the aerial photography and sure enough, they haven't deconstructed it at all. They've actually just built over it. And you can see if you look right at the end of the slipway, you can see the bottom of the structure just emerging from underneath the concrete. So we attempted to do a small photogrammetry model of the top area, which we then built into a digital elevation model. And this really helped demonstrate that the slipway and the beams did still seem to be intact underneath the concrete. So you can actually see that there's now a car park also at the top of the slipway structure. So this would have been where the winch plates would have gone and also the top of the slipway. So it actually looks now that about a third of slipway two, which is this one here, has been covered up. We've only got about two thirds remaining. So we wanted to do a survey to try and record as much of the slipway whilst it's still there and also look a little bit more into its construction. So in an ideal world, we would have cleaned this a little bit more, but fortunately with the tide and there not being too many of us, we were racing the clock a little bit. So on the main slipway, just here, this was made out of concrete and the frame in the water, which is just this one here, this was constructed from roll steel joists. Now the frame in the water seemed to mirror the frame on land. And what I mean by that is that there were three beams with cross beams traversing it. And also looking at the frame in the water, that appears to be three bollards 
that held the slipway in place. And these are actually visible at low tide. Now, if we were looking at the concrete beams on land, you can actually see that there would have been tracks sat atop them. And the way we can see this is because there's still some rust that is left there from these tracks. And we actually think that it hasn't been washed off too much because this is just on the slipway further up. And this would have been washed off because the water doesn't seem to reach here. So there would have been four tracks one on each outer beam and two in the central beam and within the rail a pull rack would have been placed and these would have had rollers so the cradle could move up and down now in the central beam which is just the picture to the right there was an array of pins and twisted steel now the pins were in a square formation and this was all along the central beam and it's possible that these were foundation bolts used to hold the tracks onto the central beam now, the twisted steel possibly would have been part of a frame and this would have been constructed for reinforced concrete. And there's actually parts of the beam where the frame is in better condition further down. The reason why they look a bit bizarrely twisted here is because the central tracks appear to have been ripped up with some force. So we recorded the remaining features of the slipway. And as you can see, a lot of the cross beams on the shore aren't too visible. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that they've been removed. It may just be that they've been covered by seaweed. And there's also on land, you can see three bollards just here. Now on one of the bollards, there would have been a metal pole. And it's very likely that this metal pole would have had cables on it that would have connected to the site. We also did some photogrammetry to capture the remnants of the slipway. And unfortunately the images on beam three which is just the beam to the left here uh, they didn't align too well so we only captured beams one and two fully but thankfully from this we were able to create an author mosaic of the model which is what we have here and then place this into gis now to do that we had to take several rtk points and how rtk works it uses satellite satellite to locate exactly where we are with in like a centimeter accuracy. So we had the RTK Rover, which is quite an impressive piece of kit. We went and we took several of these points and then we plotted them onto the ortho mosaic model that I showed you in the previous slide. And that helped georeference the model. Now, why taking RTK points is so important for this survey was because it gave me a great outline of the site. As you can actually see from this image, I was able to record the specific feature at each location and I did this little sketch when I got there as well but this was really helpful to put into GIS and have the exact layout of the site just there. It also helped for the, for the model because it means I can then just place the model onto a historic map and it's really useful to plot them onto a historical map because it shows us exactly how much of the slipway now remains. So you can see in slipway one which is just this one here it's only unfortunately a fraction of what it used to be. And just to give you some perspective on how large this site used to be, we took the coordinates at the top and the bottom of the structure, and this came out at 68 meters. 68 meters, that's just massive. And as I said, only a fraction of what the site used to be. So if you do live near the Itchen River, I really encourage you to go and check out this slipway. It is accessible, you can go right up to it, you might have some people with kayaks walk past you and ask you what you're doing but even so slipway one is a real marvel to see and i also just wanted to compare it to what the site used to look like so this is an image that was taken from britain from above it was taken in 1947 and here you can see there's barely anything around the site but you can actually see what i believe are the two winches just in the background there now, when I first saw this photo, this actually really tricked me because I thought that the slipways were built staggered. And this really confused me because I thought, well, that's a contrast to what the map shows. But actually, if you look at it, slipway two, which is just this slipway here, it's not that it's staggered at all. It's actually that the cradle has just been lowered, meaning that it would have been preparing to take on a landing craft or it's recently lowered one onto the river. But the two base plates, which you can just see at the top here, which are these two here, they are side by side, which means they would have built at the same height. So we've recorded part of the Itchen River slipway. We've, we've examined the materials and we've looked at its construction. So we have some idea of how a hauling end on slipway worked.
But the research on slipways is by no means complete. There's actually so much more that can be done. One area of research that could definitely be explored a little bit more is the environmental impact of these sites. Even though the site is intertidal, whether it could be used as some sort of artificial reef, perhaps. There was a really interesting article by Mark J. Kaiser, who talked about offshore platforms and how a tubular steel structure from the seafloor above the waterline can be quite stable for reef material. I also think more investigation should be looked into on other hauling broadside slipway types. And I would say that Horsey Island is absolutely the best for this. It's the largest, it's incredibly well preserved. So certainly a survey of that would be absolutely incredible. Another option I would say is to do a survey of a hauling end on slipway with the cradle attached. So as I've mentioned a few times, Castleton or Appledore would be ideal for this, especially Castleton because both are intact and there seems to be quite a lot of the sections of the cradle that are still there. Perhaps they can still move. It would be really good to see how they interact with the tracks. Finally, as it is my favourite site, uh, it would also be wonderful to do a survey of the Rochester slipway, uh, just because it looks like the cradle is still the top the hauling end on. And I'm just extremely curious to see how the hauling interacts with the gridiron as well. So I've listed here some works I referenced throughout my talk. I've also included some work at the bottom by John Schofield. Uh, I didn't really get to talk about him too much, but if you are interested in modern archaeology, especially Second World War, it's definitely worth checking him out. Also, if anyone would like any more information, feel free to get in contact with us at the Trust. I honestly love talking about this topic, so would happily chat to you a bit more about that. I would also like to give some thanks to these people and organisations and a big thank you to you for listening. I believe we're now going to go and have some questions.